So welcome, the next topic, topic close to my heart about learning and development. Um, a brief short introduction about myself. My name is Elfke Schout, founder of AI Bridge and also in a partnership with Go Data Driven and today as an uh, organizer as well here with uh, Giovanni and Co. Um, we'll have an interview with Dorothy. Dorothy is a leading force at IFF, driving the digital transformation within the uh, global R&D organization. In the past of her career, she also tackled topics like strategy and organization company values. And today, she will actually discuss together with Giovanni the impact of uh, learning and development within IFF. The, basically the journey how to become a data-driven organization. And she will be uh, interviewed by Giovanni. Giovanni, he's the uh, director of the Go Data Driven Academy, but a background in, uh, in physics and a large passion for, for data. He worked in the field for over 10 years, uh, first at KPMG, but now at Go Data Driven. And well, Giovanni is one of the few, um, really knows what it takes to create successful teams and, and companies in this space and uh, topic of academy. And we'll interview Dorothy on how they did it. The stage is yours. Thanks, uh, Afke. Well, Dorothy, welcome. Uh, welcome today. So, Afke said you worked at IFF, but uh, what does IFF actually do? What do they do? We, um, we develop innovative solutions for essentials like food, medicine, and hygiene products. And we're a global company, and, and just to get uh, everybody on the same page, I think it's important to say that I'm here to represent the, the R&D organization, and we merged between, um, between IFF and DuPont Nutrition and Biosciences last year, so we're now a $12 billion business and a centralized R&D function with 1,600 people on 10 different sites. So we're dispersed. Thanks. And uh, so you mean today some, some, some of the stuff we ate uh, was so good uh, because of IFF. Is that correct? Yeah. Oh, yeah. great. So it's good to know. Uh, so I know that a couple of years ago, IFF decided that data was starting to become pretty important for them. And they decided to formulate a strategy. Can you tell us a bit more about that? Absolutely. I think like we've heard many times before today is that, you know, the, the amount of data we started generating in R&D and also, of course, externally um, helped us also understand that we needed to take advantage of also the advances in digital technologies and uh, that this was going to be a ch game changer, right? If we were, were to stay relevant as the partner within Essential Solutions, we needed to do something there, both at the business level as well as at the level of the organization. So uh, that's what started it all. Yeah, so, and, and so now there are like, you know, a couple of years has passed and uh, probably, you know, we heard Stephen uh, talked in his workshop about that, that, you know, there are many components when it comes to data and AI strategy. But uh, I know that you clearly have a preference from some components above other components. So that's like, uh, you know, the tools part is very important, what are you gonna use? And you know, we also, we heard from, uh, from, uh, from agent now, the, you know, the infrastructure was the first part you tackled. However, at IFF, you saw that you needed to start somewhere else. So what, what was it? You know, in, in R&D, we're a super specialized organization, right? We have the scientists out there and, and whenever the people is the key component to, to this being successful, uh, it's a change management effort, right? So, so we thought the only ones who actually knows what's gonna help our scientists do bigger, better, more R&D are them. So we needed to find out how do we motivate them, how do we inspire them uh, to, to drive this forward, right? And then we'd think they need to drive it as an integrated part of everything we do. They need to own it, they need to uh, in exactly the same way as they own their other areas of expertise. And then I think the leadership responsibility is to build the framework around it. How do we enable them to do it so that they, they actually can? So um, that's what I'm doing with the core team, that we're the delegates of the, of the global R&D leadership team. We're building the whole framework around it. For instance, the training, the Digital Advanced Analytics Academy. And, uh, you know, I, I guess that 
like many R&D focus organizations, you also have a lot of scientists and people that are there for quite some time. Like they, they get out of uh, college or university and then they go work for IFAB because like, that's a specialty and that's a passion. Um, and did you have troubles, you know, like convincing this, you know, like the old guard, so to say, to say, you know, data and AI, that's a, you know, that's the way where we want to go? Or did they all race, the, race behind the banner uh, enthusiast? I think very early on in the process, I think one of, some of our very senior people thought that this uh, democratization of data was a little scary, right? It brings about a lot of transparency. But, but I think, uh, you know, an R&D organization is all about developing new products and new methods and, and, uh, and learning fast. And as soon as uh, even our senior people see how fast we generate knowledge now and insights, uh, they're, all, they're all in. So now, no longer. And, uh, and did they ever question the why or did, you know, was the why clearly formulated from the beginning so that it was clear so clear what directions, you know, what direction you were headed in? Um, it actually came as a push from our biotech team to start with. It didn't even start with the leadership. It came as a push from the biotech team that we have. It's a very data heavy area. And of course, they were the first ones to recognize the value, the potential value of business cases we could have from, from the data. If we only did an effort to have more healthy data than the, the data we had on little islands in different languages on, in Excel files around the globe. So, um, so I think after they managed to convince leadership we need to do something, um, the why was clear. And so, was it hard to get people off Excel? I mean, I know it's a charged question. And <laughs> yes, it was hard to get people off Excel, right? And, and, I, and I, you know, a lot of them say, well, well, I'm only testing things out by myself in little areas. It may actually be a very good tool. So the hard thing is, as soon as it takes shape, to really get them out of Excel. Yeah, of course, short term, it's super easy to work with Excel. It's a, it is a challenge, right? But, uh, but I think... We're, we're getting better and better at uh, showing the value of, of the real solutions and, and how fast the domain areas move forward where they have healthy data and good solutions. Yeah, and you mentioned, uh, you mentioned training before. So what kind of, you know, what kind of people do you train and, and for what? So do you have like different personas and what should they learn? What should they, you know, what's their role in this kind of transition to becoming more data driven? Well, we, uh, of course, started out small, like with the minimum amount of roles that's needed to drive some of these solutions forward. So we started out with leadership, of course, to make sure that they would walk the talk, right, in words and action, be champions and understand what it was all about. And then we have the business translators, the people who can actually take an idea and turn it into a data product at some point in time and run the projects for us, do the interpretation. And the last, uh, the last role is the data professionals. Whereas I think actually Stephen mentioned it a little bit about it, that we would have a lot of data scientists working uh, across the globe within different teams, but not necessarily working closely together. And getting this community up and, and going and, and having the courage to reach out to each other because they started out with this, with this course that sort of aligned among them that we're all at this level, right? And, and we actually have people we can use as sparing partners and we have colleagues that we can learn with and from. So that has made a major difference. One other thing that, that I would like to add is that when you work in R&D, every single person in the organization works with data, right? If you want healthy data, they produce it, they generate it. At some point, uh, it needs to be integrated with other people's data, which is the whole point. So it, at every level there, even technologists in the lab, they simply need to, to understand the world of data. So we added another little component, which was kind of a crash course of the leaders awareness course that was called one hour analytics, um, both to be inclusive, but also to make sure that wherever they were, there would be something for them and that we were in this together, right? There is nobody's doing work that's not relevant for this. So, uh, and we've had, I don't think, I think we had about 400 people attend the live sessions that we were running on those crash courses. So uh, even some of the people that attended the other ones. So, I mean, 
Somebody likes to have it repeated a couple of times. And so you started a couple of years ago, and of course, a couple of years ago also, COVID uh, kind of hit us whole, and of course, it was a big impact on uh, if you want to get together on a room and, and you know, learn something. Uh, was that challenging for you, or did it actually open up new possibilities? I think it, uh, in many ways, we are a global company already, right? So we're used to working remotely. Um, it's, of course, always hard to tell. It would have been easier to connect with people, but it would have been so much more cumbersome getting people in the same room, right? So we could train a lot of people at very in a very short time period. And, um, and I mean, the ratings we get from the courses are super high. I mean, the average rating satisfaction level is 4.1. Uh, on a scale from one to five, and um, so I don't, I don't hear any complaints about not having to travel. It's been very successful for us. And of course, getting high rating is nice, but are you able also to measure the impact of learning in some other way that you can say, wow, this is nice, we didn't expect that, or uh, this is actually changing the way organization, in, you know, the organization thinks about this because of course what we always say is that if you have a data and AI product and you're not like um, eliciting actions or doing something different then actually you're not changing any, anything if you the only output is a PowerPoint or like uh, you know a satisfaction core that is that is not what you you know um, you're not changing the way the company behaves so is this different with the training program you've implemented well, we, we are actually measuring it. We're measuring it in two different ways. We're measuring it as a survey, like six months after people have com completed the training, they, uh, they get a survey where we ask them, have you applied the learnings? And that score is, uh, is also pretty impressive. Uh, we also measure it on the number of project proposals that we received, where we've doubled the amount of the project proposals coming in from the organization. Uh, from last year. So so it's definitely picking up and I, and I can't help think, I think it was you Stephen also mentioning this thing about, hey, is it a centralized effort? Then you're not very mature. We're still a centralized effort to some extent on the business side though. But, but within biotech, for instance, they're running by themselves now. So we are trying to sort of the pockets around the organization that may have been a little bit slower less data heavy and hadn't had the need to the extent that they do now, so that we still have a centralized effort where we can be there to coach them to scope the projects, where we can help them with the funding if they have leaders that, not the funding, we still have funding centralized, um, and, and actually as much as we can spend as, and as much as the organization can cope in the middle of an integration as well. But, uh, but if their leaders, team leaders at the lower levels feel, ah, oh, I want to sp you to spend your time on something else, then we, um, then we still help them out, right? Putting the pressure on it. Hey, this is as important or maybe even more than meeting the next quarter's results. I may get some pushback on that one from the business, but that's my job. Make sure that it get, gets prioritized. So does it mean that you have developed a training program that, you know, two years ago nobody did anything with data and AI, then uh, people started submitting the first, you know, request, hey, I have an idea that I could use data and AI to, to solve it, and now you double that the number of requests. Is, is that correct? So you went from zero to basically you had to hire extra data scientists and data engineers to help you out. It's, is that, a, you know, it's, it's a good uh, characterization of what's happening uh, within IFF? It's not that we, we have hired more data scientists, right? But, uh, but it's more like also the quality of the projects that came in. In the beginning, we would have projects that we wouldn't even consider a project today, right? It was like, it's just a go-do. It's, it's not really a data product you're asking for. So, um, but, but one of the things that have probably caught us a little by surprise is that it's kind of like this big machinery. There's so many things that needs to happen uh, at the same time, at the right level, right? having the IT resources ready to help with the, with the foundation, the infrastructure, wherever we want to move forward, having enough people on the core team to coach them, um, do a lot of the work of still inspiring and feeding them. And, and, and <laughs> like you just said, Stephen, maybe that is because we're immature, but, but in a way I think it's going to be ongoing, right? We're going to continue to hire more people. We're going to continue to, so it's not going to sort, and it's a moving target, right? 
So, so in my head, I still ha I had this vision like uh, eyes and ears uh, and heads and hearts, hopefully, in every corner of our organization to go look for digital opportunities uh, and bring them back and help our organization to continue to do better R&D, right? But, but we're going to continue to have new people. And this Data Academy, right, it's, it's an internal pro program, so everybody will need to get onboarded on our terminology, the process we're using, and all of that. So, so it's, it may never end, right, but it's definitely until you get critical mass, it's a lot of work. And, uh, and so you mentioned some challenges, like IT was a challenge, of course, getting, uh, getting there and inspire people and coach people. And what are other challenges that you said, you know, we, we want to get there, we want to, you know, bring everybody with us. But what are other things that you said, you know, this is, it's harder than what we expected, and then, then you have some tips about that? Mm, well, I think primarily this thing about keeping the learning alive, right, is really the biggest issue, because you start training a lot of people, and then you also need to be able to feed them and support them so that they start using the learning as soon as possible, right? I think, uh, I think that was the biggest challenge, right? We had onboarded people on the why, and we had the training sessions up and going, and the good thing is that the appetite for training is still phenomenal. We have, we have waiting lists, right, for for the courses also for the rest of the, of the year. So um, that's a good sign, and that also means that they go back to their teams and talk about the training and say, "Hey, it's a good investment of my time." And it's like, well, some of the trainings are like, 32 hours, so it's not like just a go do. And you were talking before about, you know, people that started pretty early, you know, with ideas, but also, you know, implementing the first product, so to say, um, you know, what Stephen called the initialization phase. So some people would call them like the early adopters, some other people would call them the visionaries. And how do you, you know, capitalize on them? So how do you make sure that um, that potential is not wasted? We definitely did capitalize on, on the visionaries in the team. And in particular, I'm thinking about uh, one of our super engaged data scientists, actually in the Netherlands, um, who came on board and probably for the first time uh, had ambitions at the corporate level, so to speak. Hey, all I spend my time is cleaning up other people's data and, and all of that. We can do so much better. Come on, let's move forward. And, and another thing that I see is also critical are actually the leaders that dare to, to step into this area in the very early phase where they may not even have a data background. They may not even know exactly what they're looking for. But taking that first step in trying to hire people with competences that they don't know themselves, they don't really know what they're looking for. And both of these people uh, have been part of the core team when we started out early on in the process, and, and, and one of them are still with us, right? Particularly the, the leader to, to continue to run it. Our data scientist, he's off on his, uh, uh, within his biotech area, just running with it, right? So he doesn't need the same. But we still pull him in, right? Whenever we, whenever we embark on new challenges, He's still a resource that's happy to share, and it's just phenomenal to have those people. And I heard that sometimes these people also have like very clear ideas about the tools that they want to use, and of course sometimes if all you know is Excel, then it's something new is always scary. And uh, this particular data scientist, I think I heard you a couple of years ago say, well, you talk about GitLab and what is GitLab now, and we, nobody heard about GitLab again, you know, does it work with Office? And of course it doesn't. Uh, so how do you, uh, you know, was IT flexible enough or uh, was it like stifling this, kind, this sort of innovate, this bottom-up innovations? Well, in the beginning we, we did struggle with IT, right, and getting the foundation and the infrastructure in place, but, but uh, it changed pretty quickly, actually. It's like, you know, R&D is the value creation engine of, of, uh, of our company, and um, so I think it's a little bit easier to voice things and be heard, and uh, that's also, so we have quite a bit of an IT, R&D IT organization now to support us. Do we want it to expand? Probably, right? Because, um, um, I mean, like I said, it's a moving target. 
So, if it would be to summarize, and you said that we start with a why, why are we doing this? Around this, we create a strategy that has a lot of different pillars. And again, in the workshop, they were presented what these pillar, pillars are. And then develop learning journeys, training programs that people can attend to, but also where you can measure the, you know, the measure the output. What we said is that how can we show to the business that a training is successful? Well, you, you have to measure, otherwise, you know, otherwise it didn't happen. Are there other things that you would suggest people, you know, companies to embark on if they wanna if they wanna also start or accelerate their journey? Other things than uh, training? Well, the, yeah. the why, the strategy, and then this learning program and, and measuring them. Hmm. I think one of the things that I I wasn't aware of when we started out is this thing about the leadership also recognizing the contributions by the people who spend a lot of their time on this digital journey and sort of take it to their heart as well, that this is as important or more important than the science that they love already, right? They, they are all scientists. We have a, I think, uh, I think we probably don't have a single person who's not a PhD within some scientific area. And of course, that's what they love. And uh, making sure that they pay as much attention to this side of it um, is also one of the things that's super critical. And uh, so this means that, you know, this is the, you know, one of the first steps, like this, this learning. And what do you see, you know, for the future of IFF? Where, is the, where are the areas where you say, you know, now we have to tackle that one, and eh? we did this, and we did that, and what's next? Eh? The, the theme for 2022 or 2023? Well, we're, we're expanding the academy, for instance, right? With deep learning, we're, we are also embarking on a much bigger journey on, on data management, sort of outside of where we've built the, let me say, islands of different digital solutions, but really to make sure that it all fits together at the end of the day, all the way from, from dollars into to science. Um, so, but like I said, it's, it's a, it's a Moving target, right? We continue to to realize that there's so much more we can do that's going to help us differentiate. Awesome, thanks. So the time actually has passed. Are there any questions for Dory or for me? Yeah. So you mentioned that you were in touch much with training programs. The successful adoption is a critical component. How do you measure? adoption of the learning of this kind of academy and the second question what is the level of waste that you measure well i'd say so, that uh, just a second so the two questions are how do you measure the rate of adoption of the learnings and the second one how do you measure the waste and basically how big is that? and how big is that um, the, we have two ways of measuring the adoption, right? How many project proposals do we do we receive from from the organization as such, so that we can actually go develop some of those uh, data products that the organization needs to to do better, uh, and then we have the questionnaire coming out on uh, for everyone like six months after they completed the training, where we ask them, have you applied the learnings? Because they may have applied the learnings in their everyday work without necessarily developing new data product, right? Because they work with data every day. We don't have a single person who doesn't work with data. So, uh, and the waste, the first time around when we did uh, the first round of training, it was, um, I won't say, we forced people to do it. We sort of assigned them, right? We, we had a budget we needed to spend, so we speeded up the process and we thought, okay, where to start? We were learning too in, in the core team, right? And we engaged, of course, external uh, people to make sure that we would learn from what other companies have done. Uh, but we were still learning too. And uh, so we thought, okay, who are those people in this organization who would be doing this? Where are those champions out there that we can build on that's going to really want to drive this? And uh, so we assigned people to the different courses, and some of the courses may not have been a perfect fit, 
but we allowed them sort of to join another course and, and at least the, it didn't scare anyone away, right? On the contrary, some of them actually asked to participate in more than one course. Even, even the scientists that are business translators may want to join the data professionals or the data analytics uh, training sessions as well. So the waste, I don't know, probably 25%. But I think you just have to accept it. And, and one of the things that's also super important for us and the people who attended our training sessions was that we allowed people outside the R&D organization to attend the training. We work kind of as a internal consultancy, right? We work for our business units. And sometimes the business unit leaders are critical for our success. And they need to accept that we spent a certain amount of our time that we could have spent on their R&D projects on doing digital projects instead. So in order to get them with us and get their support on this journey, we were pretty open and we also encouraged a lot of our business unit leaders to, to attend at least the leadership uh, training courses, which is a four hour training. So, uh, and I think that has also been very, very critical that we have their support. Did I answer your question? Okay. Other questions? Yeah, so the question is, did you elaborate a purpose for the journey and what was the statement? What statement did you use? Well, the statement is really how do we enable us to do better, more, faster, new R&D to the benefit of people and planet. So that was kind of the purpose. But, but also another thing that was super critical in the communications with our people was this thing about if we want to stay relevant, both as a business as as an individual, we need to embark on this journey or accelerate the journey depending on where we are. And I think that's probably, I don't know if it's easier with R&D people because that's what they do. They do new all the time, right? But, uh, but I think they've been very receptive. Okay. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so I do have another question actually now that I, 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 I listen to these ones. Uh, usually R&D organizations are pretty secretive when it comes to sharing with others what they're doing. But actually, IFF has done it differently at the beginning of this journey and started sharing with other companies, you know, what they're doing. These other companies actually responded back, you know, in, with the same, uh, you know, in the same fashion, also sharing what they're doing. Can you, can you tell us a bit more about that? Yeah, I think uh, t in some areas, of course, we are secretive, right? Because what we deal with is trade secrets and we can't just share them around. But exactly like I said, this transformation is about people, right? So, so it's not like trade secrets that we're sharing. It's process. It's, it's learnings. And, and, you know, tell me who your friends are and I'll tell you who you are. It's like we need to expand this ecosystem. And, uh, and for instance, some of our external vendors helped us connect with some other interesting um, companies that uh, that helped us on our way, right? And we're more than happy to give back them. So, um, definitely. Thanks. So, if there are no other qu oh yeah. One question. So, yeah. Um, if you like, uh, the two of us, we are in a department called the Innovation Lab at our company. Kisto, it's a young department, and we're supposed to develop digital strategies for our company. So, it would be nice to embark on this journey. But one question. C-level executive, the, there are three questions, like the why, what, how. Mm -hmm. and regarding the why, the alignment is clear, why yep. we have to do this. But yep. then the further we go to the what and we steam into the how, the alignment becomes less and less, especially in terms of needed budget and, and uh, you know, things, the, the way to approach it. So how do you manage uh, C-level executives who, who give you the, 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 the task of developing something, but uh, maybe, uh, you know, if we narrow down to misalignment in terms of resources, efforts, and activities needed that we have to actually do to be successful here. Yeah, so the question is that C-level says the why, and they have a, an idea about the what and the how, but they kind of delegate that to somebody else. And of course, uh, some misalignments ensues uh, because of this, the budget, resources, what you need. So how do you deal with that? 
you go back to your executives and tell them you can't do the why without the rest, right? It, 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 you need it. it. It's not possible to do it without the funding. And the why, if that's what they say and they're not gonna fund it, it's not prioritized. It is not strategic, right? So, so it, that's what you need. You need leaders that supports this in words and action. Steven? Yeah, so, so uh, talking about this at board level priorities, I'm, uh, I'm helping another client that's also a very heavy R&D organization. And they have 10 corporate strategies, of which people is one. But they're moving all forward uh, a little bit at a time. But it, it, you know, it feels very heavy for them because you cannot work on 10 strategies at the same time. How would you make sure that they will focus more on the people side first uh, rather than naming all uh, so, because it sounds like you, you really focus on people change, yeah. right? To, to enable this data-driven transformation journey. Yeah. So how can you make that, uh, how, how do you sell that? Yeah, so maybe the question is, how do we convince leadership that they need to start with people yeah. when they're embarking on this journey, yeah, yeah. instead of starting from nine other different areas? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, well, I don't know, I think, um, well, if they're R&D heavy, it should be quite obvious, right? Because we have, you know, unique scientists and, and they, um, they need to buy into any tech and tool you try to, you try to implement because uh, if they don't, they won't adopt it, right? And you can't just change them, right? It's, uh, so I think from an R&D perspective, it's been super easy. But I think within some of those other functions that may be, can maybe use more standardized solutions, maybe you don't need the same amount of uh, focus on the people side, right? For instance, an HR organization, you may have 80% standardized and 20% uh, uh, customized, whereas we're exactly the opposite, right? So there is no way around those scientists. They need to drive it and have it be an integrated part of them. Well, thanks again, uh, Dora. Let's... Uh Give her another round of applause. And we have a break until uh, 15.35, so then the session continues. Thanks.